What do you want to thank God for tonight? Another day of life. Another day of life, that's right. Sunshine, warm weather. That's a nice break, isn't it? Yeah. I want to thank God for getting me through my latest hospital visit. It's a praise that you're able to be here tonight. Yes. We're glad. We praise, we praise God for that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what else? Thank God for kids. <laughs> thank God for what? Kids. <laughs> kids. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I don't know if it's a praise or not. We got our room down with that killing on there. That's a praise. I was going to say, Beth, yeah. you, are you not sure, Charlie? <laughs> is there a 50 50? You haven't made up your mind if this is a praise or not? Yeah. It, it's nice. He has his own computer room now, and I have a dining room table again. Yeah. So oh, okay. <laughs> so you can actually eat at the dining room table. Yeah. Somewhat. Small meals. <laughs> Frequently. <laughs> um, just uh, by way of announcement, we have a couple of things that are coming up. Sunday morning, during the children's worship time, and this is for the kids. I'm sorry, all you grown-ups, but uh, it's pajama pancake day in children's worship time. And we were asked by some adults if they could wear their pajamas to worship, and I, I guess that's up to them, but uh, as long as they're appropriate, right? <laughs> uh, but uh, so there's that, and then... Um, Next Wednesday is not regular Bible study. We're going to have a, a service to kind of mark the beginning of the day to, be, uh, to uh, Good Friday and Easter. And it's uh, uh, what is called Ash Wednesday. It's the beginning of the Lenten season. And it's a time to kind of challenge us to think about the price that Jesus paid for our sin. And uh, it's, so it's a, an opportunity for some introspection and spiritual preparation for that. And then uh, the, I believe the yard sale is taking place on the 17th. Uh, that's a week from Saturday. It's in for missions raising money for uh, the Hunger Challenge. And then the Hunger Challenge is on the 24th, so that's coming fast too. So uh, there is a sign-up sheet for that. Uh, most, actually, most of our spots are, have been claimed, but there's some still there if you'd like to get wiggle in there and... Um, and uh, get your name in there, that'd be great. So, okay, any other announcements I should probably toss out? Hearing none, then let's open in prayer. So, Father God, we bless your name. We thank you, Lord, that we, as a, as a family of believers, Lord, can gather together in the name of Jesus, our Savior. That we can gather in his name, Lord, because, Lord, he died for us, Lord. And, and that intentionality, Father, your intentionality, your plan and purpose for Jesus, your son, having gone to the cross, is so that our sin, Lord, as we place our faith in you and repent of our sin and turn to you, Lord, uh, as our sin is paid for, we, it is judged, it is put away from us, Lord. We are made clean in your sight, and, Lord, we may approach your throne of grace. And so tonight we do that as a family of believers, Lord, praising you for the ways that you've answered prayer, for your deliverances, for your protections, Father, for all the ways that you've guided us and helped us and provided for us. Lord, for the needs that we have shared tonight and that have been on our hearts for the past several weeks, Lord, we pray, Lord God, that you would make yourself known in each need. But Lord, that your hand would be upon uh, the bodies of those, Lord, who are suffering physical affliction. Your hand would be upon the hearts and the, and the soul and the spirit, Father, of, of, of each one involved, Lord, so that, Lord, they would feel your presence, your comfort, Lord, and your guidance, Lord, in times that are very challenging. And, Lord, we pray for those who are not here tonight. We pray for your, your Holy Spirit to bless them and help them, Lord, whatever it is that they have to do, Lord, and that you bring them back into fellowship on Sunday, or the fellowship of our worship time and the fellowship of Bible study in weeks to come, Lord. Lord, we thank you that everyone who's here is here tonight. And I pray, Lord God, in Jesus' name, that you would bless them and speak to them and their hearts, Lord, would be encouraged, strengthened, Lord, and challenged by you as you do your work in their lives. Lord, find us sensitive to you, ready to hear from you, open to you, Lord, ready to receive from you, Lord, and ready to be a surrendered people, Lord, so that the glory of our God might be made known through us. And that the name of Jesus, Lord, would be lifted up through us. 
We pray, Lord God, that you will, your Holy Spirit will move and that we'll hear the words that you are speaking to us tonight. And so we pray in Jesus' name. Okay, so <clears throat> tonight I want to just, uh, before we get into chapter 4, to revisit some of the things that have happened in chapters 1 through 3. And uh, you'll recall, of course, I won't belabor the point in regard to um, the divine machinations, uh, the, the, the things that God was doing to bring about the things we read about in the chapters we're in tonight and the days that readings that follow, uh, except to say that God was clearly in it, uh, even when people didn't sense his presence, when they felt crisis, when they felt problems, in this particular case it was Hannah, and especially, God was working through that, and I think we were reminded, I hope, that uh, as we ourselves find ourselves challenged in our walks of faith, that God is working often very quietly, silently, alongside of us in our situation so that His will can be done in us and through us in ways that bring glory to Him, that bring an awareness that our God is bigger than we thought. He's greater than we realized. He's more loving than we knew. Because that's exactly how Hannah found Him. He was, he was so much more than her experience up to that point had allowed her to understand and know. So he allowed a crisis in her life, which was the fact she was childless, and, and there were certain aspects of that that created special challenges spiritually. She was very burdened and very grieved and anguished by it. But God allowed it in order to bring her into a deeper knowledge of himself. And he took her crisis to set in motion not just a blessing for her, and this is important, not just a blessing for her, but a blessing through her, through her son, for the people of God. And for generations that we still are benefiting from. Not only do we have the account of, of, of Samuel's life and his ministry and the effect that he had in, in those days. The effect of his ministry had such an impact on the things that God was doing in the world that it is still impacting us today. We'll come to that. So, in contrast to Samuel, of course, who is that young man that the Bible tells us does not let any word from God to fall to the ground. Who were, who were the other people in the story, not counting Elkanah, which was uh, uh, Samuel's father, his biological father, or Perenna, which is the, uh, the other wife of Elkanah. Uh, who were the other people in the book of 1 Samuel so far. Eli. Eli and his two sons, right? And what was the deal with Eli and Eli's two sons? Disobedient to the Lord. That's right. They were they were disobedient and Eli's, well, let's, let's focus on the sons. What were, the, and I, I don't want to rehash in great detail about it, but it's, it's important. They were very, very contemptuous of God. And you know what I mean when I say contemptuous, right? That they, it's as if they despised God. When they did what they did, those things were especially directed at the things that were intended to help people to know God, know God's love, know God's power, know God's holiness and His glory. And they were attacking it. They were using those things of God very selfishly. You recall? And uh, in particular, of course, they were defiling the sacrifices that people would bring. Um, and not only that, but they were defiling the women who were serving God in the tabernacle. And both of these things are very serious affronts. It's as if they were, uh, we, I used this expression last time. Time, and that was that they were basically, in a sense, spiritually spitting in the face of God. So what was Eli's problem? He was letting it go on. He was letting it go on, right? So now it's important that we understand what the real failing is here. Because remember, we, we said this, and I can't stress this enough, 
Eli was not responsible for what his sons chose to do. He was responsible for how he handled it. He didn't, he didn't aggressively address it. He didn't intervene when he could have and he should have. He didn't do what he should have done. And the reason I say that is because we're going to see sometime later uh, what the Bible has to say about Samuel's sons. And they don't work out very well. And uh, I, I mention that because Samuel's still <coughs> esteemed by God, but yet his, his sons are selfish and they're unjust and so forth. And so how are they different from Eli's sons? Why is, sons? Why is Eli judged more harshly than Samuel? Well, there's a reason. Samuel evidently intervenes. He does what he can, but he can't control his son. Eli doesn't do what he should have done. He's not responsible for what his sons choose to do, but is responsible for having not attempted to really correct them. He, he shames them a little bit, says you shouldn't do those things, but remember, it's sort of this half-hearted, passive-aggressive response that doesn't really confront the sin. Okay, so Eli's, in the eyes of God, guilty. And he's participating in the contempt that his sons show God. And God's not passive about his glory. He's not passive about his reputation. And so if someone is essentially besmirching his name, he's going to take it very seriously. Because he protects his name. Why does he protect his name? We talked about this too. If we were a human being, we'd say, well, they're, <clears throat> they're kind of stuck on themselves. But that doesn't work with God. Because God is as great as he says he is. God is uh, completely perfect in every way. So when God says, you know, I'm great, he's not bragging. This really is the fact. And he tells us these things because of all the needs that we have on planet Earth. We think about you know, food and shelter, relationships, and, and uh, warm, you know, warm houses and, and clothes and, and stuff like that, right? We think of those kinds of things. You know, purpose, a good job, you know, friends and hobbies, etc. We think about, oh, I need this and I need that and that kind of thing. But you know what you need most, right? And that is God. So, <clears throat> whenever there is something present in your life that communicates the idea that you need it more than you need Him, God's going to attack it. He's going to come against it. What is it in life, what is it that we call something in life that you pursue before you pursue God? Idol. It's an idol. It's idolatry. Now, it's very, it, it's very indicting for us because we often don't think of it that way. But if I let my job become more important to me than God, I have an idol, don't I? If I have a human relationship, even my marriage, if that takes precedence... Over my relationship with God, what do I have? I, we don't want to call it that. We th we like to think idols are those little things, you know, that we put that not we necessarily, but some people put on their shelves and they have incense burning around, you know, or these great big statues and people are bowing down to that. But that's an idol. Well, anything you love, anything that takes your attention before God your time, your resources, your energy, but becomes your passion. That is an idol. God attacks that because we think we need these things. I don't have time for God. I don't have time for church. Well, you know what? There's going to come a day in eternity when we step into eternity, we'll realize I should have made time for Him. Because in retrospect, when we step into eternity, we look back at how we lived our lives. We think about how much time we spent at work, how much we spent on, spent how much money we spent on our hobbies, or uh, you know all the good that we do did in order to get a good reputation. We're going to look back and think that's over and done with. And now I have all this eternity before me, and I have nothing to show for it. Because you know what goes with us into eternity. It's what comes out of our relationship with God. Only that. So, idolatry <clears throat> is very serious. And 
Eli's sons, their, their selfish regard and their contempt of God relegated God to, in the, uh, in the minds and the opinions and the perspectives of those who were watching them do these things, and it appears that, oh, they're getting away with all this stuff. Where is God? Does God not care? God's not real? Somehow God is, he's, he's, he's being relegated to a force that isn't real or isn't interested in a, enough to do something in real life things. In other words, God isn't really connected. He's not paying attention. He's not involved, etc. And so if God's not connected, God's not involved. God doesn't love me. God's not present. I might as well do what? Live for myself. Just like Eli sends her doing. So God's going to attack that because it's idolatry. And it teaches people, idolatry teaches people that you can have substitutes for God. So God comes after it. So, what does God say he's going to do about the contempt of Eli's sons? The contempt that they had for God? Just sum it up. Dead. Do I? He's going to strike them dead. Right. And not only are they going to um, be judged, and God's judging, there's, the, there's physical judgment and there's spiritual judgment. And spiritual judgment, judgment is where we just have, we end up having if we're not in Christ, we are faced with the condemnation that we deserve. And that's a, that's a spiritual condemnation, and it goes into eternity. But the physical judgment that God shows, in part, has to, sh has to do with God showing the world that God is involved, God is connected, God is paying attention, God takes His name seriously, and that we should take Him seriously as a result. That's what happened in Egypt. God taking His name seriously, and God proving to the world through those plagues... That God's on his throne. And he's not going to suffer a rival. So his sons face a physical judgment. And I assume, of course, they were also followed that as spiritual judgment too. What does Eli face? Is he like, well, I mean, there's the judgment of having lost his sons to this judgment of God. There's that. And that was a judgment. But not only that. He's going to no longer have any elderly children on the throne. Yeah, so, yeah, the, the whole priesthood that follows is going to be affected. You're right. It's going to be affected by his negligence. His negligence. And this is serious because we have a tendency to think that our sin has a, uh, a way of only affecting us. Well, this is just between me and God. No, 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 no. Your sin, even if it seems very private to you, affects other people all the time. So God takes it seriously in that regard also. So Eli's sin is going to be judged in such a way that it follows him. That sin will have implications and ramifications and consequences for his household. Not just that present day, but his lineage even. It sets in motion years of consequence, of of. of of, of loss and pain because of his failure to act. And I think of this, I think one application of that before we go into chapter 4, which deals with some of the workings out of the, these things we're talking about. The implication of that is, for us, is that um, when I neglect my relationship with God, then I'm missing the opportunity for the good things of God in my life. And what are the good things of God in my life intended for? Not just for me, but just like with Hannah, those good things passed through her into a lineage, didn't it? All right, so your walk with God, when it is what it should be, has positive consequences for your family. That doesn't mean you're not going to have problems, and that doesn't mean they're all going to, like Samuel's sons, which we'll talk about later, that they're all always going to do what they're supposed to do. No, it doesn't mean that, but it has, it sets things up for them and their walk with God to prosper, to experience Him, to succeed, to have faith. If I live selfishly, if I live sinfully, even if no one else knows, then I'm robbing my descendants, my children and their children and so forth, of the things that God might have done through me. 
the strength of the Spirit, the patience that I might have shown them. You know, and I know I'm not perfect, and my kids can tell you that, of course, as all of us is true of all of us here. And we're not perfect. And it's not to say we have to be perfect. It doesn't mean beat yourself up if you fail and falter. But it means this, that if you're seeking God and you're humbly seeking His help, then it's going to have a positive impact on your children. And the grace of God will chase after them. But if you don't, you live selfishly, then they suffer the loss of what God might have done through you. God can do in spite of you even if you're the most selfish person in the world, in spite of you, God might do great things. We have records of, in, 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 in the scriptures of children, of people who weren't so nice and, and so, so forth, and God using them anyway. Okay, so all of that is sort of a rehash of things um, that have happened in chapters 1 through 3. And now that brings us to chapter 4. Okay, I wonder if uh, somebody would like to read verses 4 through 11. Four through 11. Oh, 1 Samuel 4, yeah. 1 through 11. 1 through 11. Now the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out to battle against the Philistines. They encamped at Ebenezer, and the Philistines encamped at Aphek. The Philistines drew up in line against Israel, and when the battle spread, Israel was defeated before the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 men on the field of battle. And when the people came to the camp, the elders of Israel said, Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord here from Shiloh, that it may come among us and save us from the power of our enemies. So the people sent to Shiloh and brought from there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Hosts, who is enthroned on the cherubim. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. As soon as the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel gave a mighty shout, so that the earth resounded. And when the Philistines heard the noise of the shouting, they said, What does this great shouting in the camp of the Hebrews mean? And when they learned that the Ark of the Lord had come to the camp, the Philistines were afraid, for they said, A God has come into the camp. And they said, Woe to us, for nothing like this has happened before. Woe to us, who can deliver us from the power of these mighty gods? These are the gods who struck the Egyptians with every sort of plague in the wilderness. Take courage and be men, O Philistines, lest you become slaves to the Hebrews as they have been to you. Be men and fight. So the Philistines fought, and Israel was defeated, and they fled, every man to his home. And there was a very great slaughter, for 30,000 foot soldiers of Israel fell, and the ark of God was captured. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, died. Okay. So we are uh, seeing what God has predicted, and what God has foretold, or what God has judged, coming about in the first half of chapter 4 here. And uh, so let's sum it up. Um, what, who are the parties involved? We have, on the one hand, we have the army of the... Hebrews, and then on the other side we have the army of the Philistines, Philistine, right? <clears throat> and it tells us that they fight, and right off the bat, the uh, Philistines are beating the Israelites, right? And the Israelites, they say, what, what, what is their question? Why are we losing, right? Well, I know. I know what we need to do. Let's bring the uh, Ark of the Covenant out. Right, verse three. Let's bring the ark of the covenant out, and uh, uh, and it will save us from the power of our enemies. Why would they think that? Because it had before. They've associated it with victory before. It would be the symbol of God's presence. And so, historically, in the days of the judges, and technically, we're still in the days of the judges. We're at the very, 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 very tail end of the days of the judges, but it's still the era of the judges. But when they had left uh, Egypt and when they would go out into the days of the Exodus, the 40 years of Exodus, and then in Joshua, when they crossed into Canaan and, and so forth, what were they to do with the Ark of the Covenant? They would have, it would go before them. Remember the Battle of Jericho? Remember when they crossed the Jordan? What happened? How did they cross the Jordan? Well, the priests, the ones that were 
there was a certain way they had to carry the ark. It was a very, very prescribed way. But and then they 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 go out into the River Jordan, and where they go, the river dries up so that the armies of Israel can cross. Right? Remember that? And then they cross over. And uh, that's where they set up the 12 stones of uh, remembrance and so forth. And then they go and they fight the battle of Jericho. But it starts with the ark. The ark led the way. But what was it about the ark? What do you recall about the ark in particular? What's that? God dwell in the ark? In a sense, he did. I mean, God doesn't inhabit a house like we do or a thing, a box, which this was. But it was symbolic of his presence. And you'll notice in the, uh, uh, in the uh, chapter, or chapter 4, verse 4, where it says, as they bring out the ark of the covenant, it says, uh, from there the ark of the covenant, the Lord of hosts, who is enthroned on the cherubim. What it's referring to, I've got a little, somebody made me a model of the ark of the covenant in my office there. It, it, what they're referring to uh, are these two golden statues of the of the cherubim, these angelic servants of God, and that lid of the ark, which has in it the tablets of uh, the Ten Commandments and Aaron's rod and so on. Um, that lid is called the mercy seat. Okay, the mercy seat is what would be in the most holy place of the tabernacle, and later on the temple. Because at this point in time, they had that portable temple, which they called the tabernacle, which was that enormous tent, the tent of meeting. And it was at, on the mercy seat, they would apply certain sacrifices. In particular, the Day of Atonement, they would apply that special sacrifice. That mercy seat. Why, would they, why is it called the mercy seat? Why do you think it's called the mercy seat? Because God had mercy on Israel. Yeah, and it's because of God. That's where they encounter the mercy of God. And he sits in the in, 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 in instead of in sitting uh, in, instead of, of, of judgment, he was sitting in in mercy. Here I'm trying to say something. My tongue went blurry. <coughs> the mercy seat. So it's it's representative of the presence of God. Did anybody did anybody ever see the uh, uh, the movie uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark? Okay, that's a Hollywood version. Okay, so you take it with a grain of salt, right? Um. But the idea there is, of course, that, that it, it, it's representative of God's presence. <clears throat> now, is it really where God is present? No. Yes and no. God, it isn't in the sense that God, he's too enormous to be contained in something like that. However, it's, it's a point of focus where his presence is known and made known. So where it would go and it would lead, it would represent the presence of God going before his people. And where the presence of God goes before his people, so does victory. So that's happened again, like you said, happened again and again and again and again and so forth. But there were times when they were not, even when they did this, there were times when they didn't have victory. Like when God had said, you're not going to go into the promised land yet because you haven't listened to me, you haven't trusted me, you've been in rebellion. And they tried to anyway, and it doesn't work out so well. <coughs> well, here they are with the Ark of the Covenant. As if it's a magic talisman. A lucky rabbit's foot. That will give them victory. What's the problem with that spirituality? What are they, what are they trying to make of God? A puppet. A puppet. They're trying to use him. So they have it backwards, don't they? They have it backwards. You know, God doesn't just do what we want. We, have, we are his. He is God. He is Lord. So we do what he says. That's what, the way it's supposed to be. And we do it in faith because he's good and he's great. But we do it because he deserves it. And, you know, he's God. And we're not. So they try to take the Ark of the Covenant out, and they go, they lead it out, and they, what happens? I mean, they take it out, and all the Israelites, they're like, hey, you know, because they know the stories. It's been told to them over and over again of how great 
God is, and that when they took the ark, when the ark of the covenant, the presence of God went before them, they would have victory. And so here they've been losing, and now here comes the ark of the covenant, and they've got thousands of people, and they see this symbol of the presence of God, and they assume. This is, it's a dangerous thing to make assumptions about what God will do and what he won't do. Especially when you assume that because you do this, that, and the other thing, that he's going to just do what you want him to do. Because when we do that, we do what they're doing here, we try to make God a puppet. And you can't do that. Because God is God. So, what do they do when they bring the Ark of the Covenant out? Shout. Yeah, I mean, and it's such a big shout. Everybody just shouting. I mean, it's like, it's bigger than the Super Bowl. You know, the carrying on of everybody. And the Philistines hear it. I mean, it's, I mean, the ground, the earth itself is resounding, it says. The Philistines hear it, and what is the Philistines' response? This is the quiet section over here. What do you guys think? <laughs> they had heard the stories, too, of the God. And so they thought, that mighty God is the God that brought them out of Egypt with the plagues. It does and say that, doesn't it? And we ought to be fearful. Yeah. And they, they had to think about what they had done, bringing the ark into the battlefield. Yeah, I, one of the things I'm struck with, when I'm reading about, when I'm reading about the, uh, the plagues and about what God says about the plagues and what he says about Egypt and so forth, is that the things that he does there aren't just for the Israelites. It's also for the Egyptians. To hear and to know that there's one God. Not all the gods that they worship. Not all these pantheons that they have. And, and so forth. Hundreds of little gods and so forth. The God of this and the God of that. There's one God. And, it, and it's the God that Hebrews have been called into relationship with. Um, and it's not just for the Egyptians. It's not just for the Israelites. It's not just for the Egyptians. What do we find here? We find that it's for people beyond the Israelites, beyond the Egyptians, those parties involved at that particular time. You know what? It was for the world, for all nations of the earth to hear that there is one God. There is one God, the God of the covenant, the God who established his covenant with his people of Israel, whether they deserved it or not. So the Philistines, they hear about it, and their response is, what emotionally do they feel? Uh, respond. They're stricken with fear. They are. They're they're, they're afraid. Mm -hmm. Which, of course, is what the Hebrews probably are hoping for and delighting in. Oh, yeah, look, like they're scared, you know, that kind of thing. But what do the Philistines do with their fear? Be men and fight. Be men and fight. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting to me, too, just what they say in verse 9. And, and, and be men of, Philist of Philistines, as Diane says, lest you become slaves to the Hebrews as they have been to you. I mean, you can see what their agenda is. It's not just coexistence. They want to dominate, right? I mean, it's not just, hey, we want to just live over here peacefully and you Hebrews can live over there and we'll just go get along and just you mind your affairs and we'll mind ours. No, that's not what the Philistines want. What do the Philistines want? It's right. What's that? Slaves. They want slaves. They want to dominate them. They want to control them. They want to. They'd rather wipe them out than have them just be free over here doing their thing. They don't want to coexist. So uh, they do what Diane says. They say, "Be men and fight." And it tells us how that goes for the Israelites. It's not such a happy story. It tells us just in two verses a huge thing. <clears throat> Again, so the Philistines fought, okay, and the Israel was defeated. And it, does, and it doesn't just leave it at that. It wasn't just a, like a football game and somebody went home and that was that and they were sad because they lost the trophy. No, it means that as they were fleeing, there was a great slaughter. This was costly. Their nonchalant <coughs> attitude about God <coughs> is costly. I mean, when, we, when I say costly, I don't mean it just hit their pocketbook or their bank account. 
it cost lives. People died, and a lot of people died. 30,000 foot soldiers. Now, for the Israelite, that would have been horrific enough. That was a terrible blow. But do you know it was actually a worse blow? It's in verse 11. They carried away the Ark of the Covenant. Yes. And you know what this means? It means that Israel, for the first time in a long time, is going to have what we might call a mega existential crisis. Because the typical soldier there, assuming that God was with us, our ark has gone before us, and God's going to bring us the victory here, instead, not only have we lost, and lost big, my brothers are lost, they die, uh, you know, my you know, sons have been lost, etc., but the ark was captured. How can that be? Do you understand what I'm saying? This turns their theology upside down. They assumed that because they had the ark, this artifact, this talisman, as I called it, or whatever you want to refer to it as, they assumed that because they had it, they would automatically win. And not only did they not win, they lost it. It's as if God didn't show up. Where is God? God didn't win this for us. We lost the ark. And, not, and for that, a lot of people were looking at the ark the way some of the Philistines looked at it. And they associated the ark, the covenant, as where God physically was. So if we don't have the ark where God lives, it's over there, then they captured our God. And that's how the Philistine will come to that in, uh, in uh, chapter 5, but we'll, uh, we'll come to that. But do you see, it, it, it's this huge situation for them. Now, who are we? That's the question that's going to come out of this. Who are we? Why are we here? What, what's life all about? What are we going to do? They're, they're going to question whether or not God exists, God remembers his covenant. God loves them. God is holy. God is good. They don't know who they are. Maybe God has rejected us and we're lost forever. We're going to just be wiped out because God didn't show up. He walked away and he's forgotten us. Now that's not what really happens, but based on their circumstances, that's how they'll read it. It's a bad day. It's a very, very bad day for Israel. So in verse 12, would somebody write, like to read verses 12? Um, and we'll just read down to verse 22. Said, 
The glory has departed from Israel, for the ark of God has been captured. I'm not sure you can find um, many other passages. Uh, you, you can find some, but there, there are a few that carry a certain kind of weight to them. I think this is one of those passages. Ichabod, the glory of God is departed. So what do you know about Eli's response? Of course, the people, they he comes, this guy from the tribe of Judah, he, uh, Benjamin, he shows up and he's carrying with him the news of how that battle goes. Right? And it's not good news. And people are hearing it. And there's a great outcry. Eli can't see what is, what's going on. He can hear things, but he can't tell what it all means and so forth. And this guy makes his way to him. And, he, and of course, he knows it can't be good news. So when he asks the question, verse 16, how did it go, my son? In large part, it's him trying to assess the damage. Just how bad is it? And the messenger from the tribe of Benjamin, he explains, he, he tells him, he says, Israel has fled before the Philistines. We lost the battle. And there has been a great defeat among the people, by which one can logically deduce that there has been uh, a lot of loss of life. And then something that he was probably more reluctant to tell Eli than knew he had to was that Eli's sons had died. Ophni and Phineas. And then the last thing he says that the Ark of the Covenant had been captured. It's hard for us to understand just how that would have hit Eli's ears, how it, how it would have affected him. But of all the scenarios that he probably entertained, this was one that and that crossed his mind. Loss, maybe. Defeat, perhaps. Even his sons having died, he could probably understand that because of what God has already said to him. But the full measure of how tragic <coughs> isn't just in regard to his household. It's to his whole people for whom he was responsible. What has happened? The Ark of the Covenant has been captured. It's as if somebody was able to walk off with God. With some, it was as if God had walked off with them. Because only God can determine the outcome of the battle. So what happens when Eli hears that news? Well, he, he falls over, right? He falls over backward. He breaks his neck and he dies. <clears throat> what was it in particular... The, the, that the Bible associates with him having that reaction wasn't the defeat, was it? It wasn't the fact that Israel had lost that battle. It wasn't even that his sons, Phineas and Hophni, had died. Although, for most of us as parents, that we think that's probably what would do it for me. But what was it the Bible says was the trigger for that reaction? Because they thought God walked away from. Them. Yeah, it was. Yeah, the Ark of the Covenant. It's, the, it's gone. gone. Yeah. So for hundreds of years, the Ark of the Covenant has been consecutively in the possession of God's people. Never once has this happened till now. On His watch. So as Eli hears this news, the full weight of the tragedy of the spiritual predicament of his people falls entirely onto him because this isn't just about his household. This is about how God has departed from his people. When I say departed, what I mean is that his protective power, the assurances of his provision and, the, and, and that certain knowledge of his presence This falls on Eli's shoulders. 
Now his daughter-in-law, of course, uh, she's, you know, her husband, who's terribly flaky, um, she's pregnant. She goes into what we assume is early labor, probably. And her reaction, of course, she, she has a similar reaction. It's not that her husband has died, necessarily. It's, it's what? What does she focus on? When they say, don't be, don't be afraid, it's okay, things are going to be okay, you have a son, hey, what does she respond with? What does she name the child? Think about That's not a good name. It's not a good name. Because it means what? Glory has departed from Israel. The glory has departed. The presence of God has departed Elvis Presley, Elvis has left the building. Well, this is God has left his people. Now, she doesn't see the big picture. You know, that God really hasn't left, that he's actually, he's orchestrating a, 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 a period of repentance and return for his people. He's working on that, and he's setting them up for that. He's not really abandoned them, but they have lost that immediacy of Fellowship that they had once enjoyed with God. And the things that they took from granted. And remember that they had come to the place where they had loved the blessings more than they loved the blesser. So God takes away the blessings. Why? So that they can be restored in their love for the <coughs> blesser. Sometimes God does that. He'll take away our blessings so that he can restore our love for the blesser. Ichabod. The glory of God has departed. It's a very bad day for Israel. Sin and selfishness sooner or later erupt into tragic consequences. Now, was it necessary that these things come about? In one sense, no. If there had been repentance. If there, if there had been a, a, a hearing of the word of God, for instance, if Eli had responded as he should have, perhaps his sons would have repented. I don't know that they would have. But all of this abandonment of God by the people of God led to an experience now for the people of God to feel abandoned by God. You follow that? The problem wasn't that God had abandoned them. The problem was that they had abandoned God. Now, when we abandon God, usually we don't recognize it. We don't know it. We kind of drift until we find ourselves one day far away from Him. But when we abandoned him. We make choices corresponding to that. And those choices, they drag us from relationship with him. They break our fellowship with him. God loving his child does what needs to be done to restore us, but it always has to it always has to do with turning our hearts back again. Is God content in our being happy if our happiness isn't founded in Him? No. No, He's not. We've talked about this. You know, If you're happy and it's not because of God, God's probably going to do something about the idols that are making you happy in your life. Why? Because you and I were created for what purpose? To serve the Lord. To serve Him. And the great commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and strength. In Deuteronomy 6, we talk about this too. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, He is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and strength. And Jesus says that's the foundation for everything the prophets had to say. So, their hearts were far from God. Now they're in a position where they feel abandoned by God. 
And God allows this. God orchestrates this so that he can turn them in time back to him. Isn't it good to know that we can look on the other side of this particular event? Because if, if our story ended here, we didn't know what happened after, we would probably be very, very depressed. Thinking that they really blew it with God, God's going to just move on, and, and that's that, and I feel bad for the Israelites because they abandoned God, and now He's abandoned them. Has God really abandoned them? No, but they're going to feel like it. And He's going to let them feel like it. So that they remember what a treasure they had when they had fellowship with Him. Remember this, that you and I, having been created to love God with all our heart and soul and strength, we need to remember what treasure we have in Him. How valuable, how precious fellowship with Him is. And what it cost Him for us to have that. Because we know what it cost him. It cost him his son. Who gave his life for us. Endured the agony of the cross so that we could be forgiven. So, um, do you have any thoughts, any comments on this uh, particular chapter? It's kind of heavy, isn't it? Kind of heavy. I think in some ways it's a good place for us to be when we get ready to have, um, um, when we're getting ready to enter into the Lenten season. Um, the whole purpose of um, the Lenten season is to, as I said before, to spiritually prepare for the crucifixion of Jesus, where we mark that on Good Friday, and then, of course, the resurrection of Jesus, which we celebrate at Easter time. Um, we can easily lose sight of how serious our sin is, um, how heavy it is, how ugly it is to God, and the implication of sin that's not repented of. Know, how it kind of rolls and grows like that snowball going down the mountain top, mountainside until it's this enormous thing that crushes us. So, this is a good thing for us to read, although it's hard to read. I find it hard to read this. When I read chapter 4 and I read that passage about Ichabod, I, I become emotional. Um, when I think about the glory of God having been taken away from his people how the immediacy of his presence the greatness of God that, that security they enjoyed and took for granted how that was just gone, ripped away and how lost they would feel now how, how alone and what a terrible place that is <laughs> but that's where we are we don't have Christ. And that's why it took the cross. As ugly as it is. Because our sin is that ugly. So uh, let's, uh, let's close in prayer and uh, let's thank God that he went to great lengths to preserve this record of the experiences of his people so that we could read them and we could recall them and consider the meaning of these things in our own relationships with the Lord. Um, Father, we just thank you that you've allowed us to read your holy word and that as we consider, Lord, the God that we are praying to right now is the God who called it Israel out of Egypt and protected and provided and guided them and guarded them and helped them and brought about these things so that they might learn how precious a treasure you are. That you're the God that we can know today through Jesus. And in spite of the fact, Lord, that we have fallen short, we have sinned, we, we've been guilty. And we deserve hell. We deserve death. We deserve, Lord, punishment. Yet, and yet, in mercy, Jesus came 
He died for us. He rose from the dead. And your spirit has been poured out on us so that we might know you. We might have hearts, Lord, that yield to that grace and respond to it with faith. Thank you. Oh, Lord, help us to not take you for granted. Help us, Lord, to not assume, Lord, that uh, we're just good with you and we can live selfishly and, or self-righteously, Lord. Help us, Lord, to treasure you as our first love. To put away those things, Lord, that poison our fellowship with you and that poison the story of your goodness at work in our lives, Lord, as others watch us. Let them see, Lord, your love, your goodness. Let them even see, Lord, your holiness peeking through us, Lord, as we live lives that are set apart for you. Lord, our desire is that instead of Ichabod, that as people look upon your church here, Lord, that we would be a people where God is working in power and in mercy and in love. Please do the work in each of our hearts that we might respond obediently and faithfully to you, we pray. In Jesus' name. Thank you all. I hope you have a good end of the week. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing you on Sunday.